Hello, everybody. If you followed along with me for some time, you know that the focus in my Ohio garden is primarily on edible plants. So vegetables, herbs, and some fruit. But many of you have noticed and asked about all of the various flowers that I have planted amongst my vegetables. One of the most common questions I get is about companion planting. As in, am I intentional with my different vegetable and flower pairings because of some beneficial mutual relationship between the plants? The short answer is not exactly. I don't companion plant in a strict tomatoes love carrots or roses love garlic, if you're familiar with those books, type of fashion. I've not been particularly deliberate with my plantings and I actually prefer the term intercropping or crop confusion to better explain what I'm trying to achieve in my gardens. But ultimately it does boil down to the fact that having more diversity in the garden, whether you call that companion planting or not, has many, many benefits. In today's video, I wanted to share with you what some of the benefits of intermixed plantings are, as well as my must-have annual flowers and flowering herbs. Interplanting with plants of different species can actually mask the odor or volatile chemicals given off by an insect's preferred host plant. Now note that this is a little bit different than the common belief that simply planting stinky or extremely fragrant plants around your garden will repel insects. It's more likely that plants with strong fragrances or odors kind of help disguise in a way the volatile chemicals that that host plant might give off, making it more difficult for an insect to find the plants that they want to eat or lay eggs on. Some insects also rely on visual cues to identify host plants. So again, by mixing up the plantings, you throw off the insect's ability to find that host plant just a little bit. Interplanting flowers and vegetables and herbs also helps to attract predatory and parasitic insects, which are more than happy to help me in my fight against the bad bugs in my garden. Similarly, by providing plenty of habitat and season-long forage for pollinators, I'm able to draw in more pollinating insects and pollinating birds like hummingbirds to my garden, ensuring that all of the fruits and vegetables in my garden that need it are also getting appropriate pollination. Now, in my experience, intermixed or companion plantings are not the end all beat all to a pest free garden. But in my quest to grow with all but the most minimal of organic sprays, I can use every little bit of help I can get. And I do find that mixing it up really benefits my garden overall. Plus, as I've mentioned in prior videos, some of the allure of mixing flowers in with vegetables is just visual enjoyment for myself. I find the garden so much more enjoyable with a plentiful mix of different plants and flowers and vegetables and herbs than I do with just sterile monocrop rows of veggies. And speaking of enjoying the garden, I wanted to take a minute to thank the sponsor of today's video, Shaker and Spoon. Shaker and Spoon is a monthly cocktail subscription box. Each month they send a new box with three unique cocktail recipes, as well as all of the gourmet ingredients needed to create up to 12 cocktails. I just provide my favorite liquor. There is something so enjoyable about winding down a day in the garden, enjoying a perfectly crafted drink, and being able to watch the birds and the bees and the butterflies visiting all of the flowers I have planted here. Now be sure to stick around to the end of this video where I'll be sharing which box I received this month as well as making one of those delicious cocktails. But right now I wanted to share with you specifically my must have annual flowers and flowering herbs. Now I grow a huge variety in the garden every single year, always trying out new things. But the ones I'm going to mention are things that I have on repeat every single year. And first is calendula, one of my absolute favorite early and late season forage plants for bees and other pollinators. Calendula can also reportedly deter aphids from feeding on collards and draws in a huge number of beneficial insects. Besides being a delightful herb for tea, chamomile can be effective for deterring adult cabbage worm butterflies from laying their eggs on various brassica crops. 
I had chamomile interplanted with some of my cabbage this spring and did notice less activity on said cabbages, though I've not done a true test to evaluate this yet. Like chamomile, dill can supposedly deter the egg laying of the cabbage white butterflies. Dill, if allowed to flower, is excellent at drawing certain types of predatory insects as well, including parasitic wasp, tachinid flies, and lacewings, as well as many native bees. While I love cilantro for its fresh tasting greens, I always plant extra and allow the plants to bolt. Cilantro blooms, similar to dill blooms, provide nectar to many tiny yet powerful enemies of common garden pests. I grew dwarf lemon cilantro for the first time this past spring. And while it wasn't my favorite for eating, the flower power was amazing. Now you likely have heard me rave about the benefits of buckwheat as a cover crop, but the blooms alone make buckwheat worth growing. An incredibly valuable insectary species, butterflies and bees flock to buckwheat blooms, as do many insect predators. And it comes in pink too, if you want a little more of a color punch. Try rose red soba. I always have plenty of holy basil in my garden every year because it readily self sows. Honeybees and other native bees love to forage on basil. I love the scent. It's a fantastic adaptogenic herb. And interplanting basil with tomatoes has been shown to interfere with the egg laying of the adult tomato and tobacco hornworm moths, whose larvae feed on tomato foliage. In addition to the holy basil, for the flowers specifically, I prefer Siam or Floral Spires Lavender. I plant a lot of marigolds, mainly because they're so easy to grow and I love their cherry color. Marigolds are frequently touted as beneficial companions for many crops, but there's not a lot of evidence to back that up. Some types of marigold, including the aptly named nematocidal marigold, may work to control 14 different types of nematodes, including root knot nematode, which is not a pest I deal with here. However, companion planting to achieve nematode control likely won't work. To be effective, nematocidal marigolds should be planted in the same spot that you eventually want to grow your vegetable crop. So used in a manner much like cover crop, they need to be in place for at least two months, at the end of which time the marigolds can be removed or tilled into the soil, then followed up with your desired vegetable crop. And this is really only effective for one season of control, so this would need to be repeated every season if you have serious issues with nematodes. But back to that masking of the host plant that I mentioned earlier, many types of marigolds are quite um, fragrant, stinky, depending on who you ask. And like I said, every little bit helps. So I do like to plant marigolds all over the garden just in case they do help to mask some of those volatile chemicals that an insect's preferred host plant is giving off. Now much like marigolds, I love zinnias because they are so easy and they are so gorgeous. And they're hard to beat for attracting pollinators like butterflies and hummingbirds. Now I tend to prefer the tall cutting types, but if powdery mildew is a major issue for you, consider zinnia hagiana. Varieties like Persian carpet and Aztec mix are two of my favorites, or Zinnia angustifolia, or an interspecific cross like the Profusion series. Now, of course, what is the garden without sunflowers? The presence of sunflowers in the garden will significantly increase the presence of both predators and pollinators, including assassin bugs, soldier beetles, and minute pirate bugs. Sunflowers are also a favorite of sweat bees, a group of tiny but mighty pollinators, which includes hundreds of species. I love, love, love nasturtiums and I plant them everywhere. It's a delicious peppery edible flower and pollinators love it as well. Supposedly, they help deter squash bugs from zucchini. A study by Iowa State University showed a significant decrease in the number of squash bugs on zucchini, which were interplanted with nasturtium, versus those growing by themselves on bare soil. Now, I tend to plant the big sprawling varieties, but in a small space garden, you could opt for some of the more dwarf compact types like Tom Thumb. In addition to being another plant with tasty edible blooms, bumblebees and honeybees alike love borage. Borage also accumulates nutrients from the soil, making it a good green manure. 
And a few more annuals I wanted to mention that I love for looks and for attracting pollinators to the garden include jasmine scented Nicotiana. Now I've seen the term intoxicating fragrance thrown around a lot by marketers, but in the case of jasmine scented Nicotiana, it's true. I have not grown an annual flower that emits a more beautiful fragrance than this Nicotiana does. These blooms emit their fragrance most heavily as the garden moves into dusk, supporting night pollinators like hawk and hummingbird moths. Wild petunias were new to my garden this year, or as my daughter calls them, pow in your face petunias because of their vivacious ultraviolet color. But these are a flower I will be growing on repeat for years to come. I'm not a fan of modern bedding petunias, but I love the relaxed sprawling habit, color and scent of the South American native. The hummingbirds love it too. Now, bachelor buttons are an excellent early season source of nectar for the bees, but blue diadem is my preferred variety for its incredible color and upright flop resistant plants. The daisy-like flowers of Cosmos attract small native bees who are often much more efficient pollinators for our gardens than honeybees. I love Cosmos of all type, but the dwarf sulfur Cosmos mix is probably my favorite. I love the brilliant red, gold, and orange colors and the really nice, compact, tidy habit. Now, since my garden is now full of the plants that pollinators and beneficial insects will love, I can kick back and enjoy my shaker and spoon cocktail Tail. Let's head in the house and whip up a drink. Today, I've got the All Eyes on Rye box from Shaker and Spoon. I've got recipe cards for the Baklava Sour, the Creole Sling, and the Homestead Old Fashioned. And check out all of these fun ingredients. This is one of my favorite parts, is digging through these boxes to find all the little treasures packed away. Some Baklava Syrup. Filthy black cherries, winter spice syrup, Vermont maple syrup, cardamom and chicory bitters, black pepper and orange bitters, and orange oil. Oh yes, and the cold brew that I've already started brewing. I really had a hard time deciding which cocktail to go with this time, but I think I'm going with the Creole Sling. Featuring two ounces of rye whiskey, I add one half ounce cold brew coffee. This was brewed ahead of time. One fourth ounce cinnamon and vanilla infused maple syrup and three dashes, not drops, of chicory bitters. Next, I fill the glass with ice and stir until the mixture feels cold. Then I strain into a rocks glass over a large ice cube. And for the finishing touch, spray orange oil over the drink. Now it's time to enjoy. So good. Now, for those of you that saw the last video featuring Shaker and Spoon, I mentioned that I'm not big on sweet drinks, but the way that these are crafted with just the perfect balance of each of those ingredients, bitter from the coffee and the chicory, sweet from the maple syrup, that slate acidity from the orange, perfectly complements that rye whiskey. The perfect drink for the end of the day in the garden. Now, if you want to try mixing up your cocktail game a bit, give Shaker and Spoon a try. Just use my link in the video description below and use my code GROWFULLY for $20 off your first Shaker and Spoon subscription. And if you enjoyed today's video, please consider subscribing to my channel, Growfully with Jenna. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.